To explain the depth behind Phantom, the perfection on the stage, we peel back the layers and reveal the glittering golden truth. To do this, we have to start from the beginning. And the Phantom himself gives us the first clue for our mythos. Hephaestus was a deformed god rejected and abandoned by his mother. He is a master craftsman who built the gods' palaces and tools. From the earth, he molds the first woman, Pandora, a beautiful evil whose descendants would torment the human race. She was sheer guile, not to be withstood by men. She's given a command to never open a box she'd been given by the gods, but her curiosity burned too greatly within her. She opens the box and unwittingly unleashes every malignant thing onto the world. With the exception of hope, which was the last thing to emerge from the depths after her transgression. This next myth is shortest on the list, but is probably the most important because we circle back to it a couple of different times, so remember this one. The story of Pandora is echoed in another ancient Greek myth about a sculptor named Pygmalion who carves a female statue so lifelike he falls in love with her. She is transformed into animated life by the goddess Aphrodite. Most beautiful was the human Psyche, envy of the gods. The winged god Eros is sent to shoot Psyche with an arrow so that she may fall in love with something hideous as revenge for the admirers she has. He instead scratches himself with his own dart, which makes anything fall in love with the first thing it sees. Consequently, he falls deeply in love with Psyche. Later, in search of a husband, the transported girl wakes to find herself at the edge of a cultivated grove. Exploring, she finds a marvelous house. A disembodied voice tells her to make herself comfortable, and she is entertained by singing to an invisible liar. Although fearful and without the proper experience, she allows herself to be guided to a bedroom where in the darkness a being she cannot see sleeps with her. She gradually learns to look forward to his visits, although he always departs before sunrise and forbids her to look upon him. To uncover her husband's true identity, Psyche brings out a lamp she has hidden in the room in order to see him. The light reveals the most beautiful creature she had ever seen. She is so startled she spills hot oil from the lamp and wakes him. He flees and, though she tries to pursue, he flies away and leaves her on the bank of a river. After a long journey that has many twists and turns, they eventually end up happily married. This myth is retold in East of the Sun and West of the Moon, and also Beauty and the Beast, written and published in 1740. A widower merchant lives in a mansion with his sons and daughters. The youngest, Beauty, is the most lovely. On a business trip to secure their fortune, under threat of death, he'd been strong-armed into handing his most beautiful daughter over to a beast living in a castle. Reacting swiftly, the brothers suggest they could go to the castle and fight the beast together. To release her family from the threat, Beauty volunteers to go to the beast willingly, and her father reluctantly allows her to go. Once she arrives at his palace, he gives her lavish clothing and food and carries on lengthy conversations. Every night, the beast asks Beauty to sleep with him, only to be refused each time. After each refusal, Beauty dreams of dancing with a handsome prince. She searches and discovers many enchanted rooms, but cannot find the prince of her dreams. Eventually, she becomes homesick and begs the beast to allow her to go see her family again. He allows it on the condition that she returns in exactly two months. Beauty agrees to this and is presented with an enchanted ring which will take her back to the beast when two months are up. She spends time with her family, but Beauty is determined to honor the deal she made. When the two months are almost up, Beauty begins envisioning the beast laying dead in his quarters and uses her ring to return to him. Once she is back in the castle, Beauty's fears are confirmed as she finds out that the beast died of shame. Completely devastated over the wrong choice she made, 
Beauty bursts into tears and laments that she should have learned how to love the beast in the first place. Suddenly, the beast is transformed into the handsome prince from Beauty's dreams, and he and Beauty are married, and they live happily ever after. This itself may also be a later version of the myth of Hades. Hades left his underground domain to pursue a beautiful goddess, Persephone, as one of the very few times he ever left his lair. His realm was separated from the world of the living by the river Styx, which no living soul dared cross uninvited, lest he or she be made an eternal inhabitant of the underworld as well. His realm could be reached only by boat, controlled by a ferryman who guided it with a long pole. With a few extremely rare exceptions, no one was allowed to leave the underworld once they entered. Hades, like the other gods of ancient Greece, had all too human weaknesses. Overcome by his loneliness, he abducted the young Persephone and took her to his lair as his bride. Alternatively, the story suggests that she was escaping from her overbearing family and saw it instead as a chance for freedom. Upon beginning her new life, Persephone was very unhappy, but after much time, she came to love the cold-blooded Hades and lived happily with him. He was forever faithful to her alone. Persephone was one of the very few who, eventually, was allowed to travel back and forth freely from the underworld and the world of the living. And now we circle back to the story of Pygmalion. Trilby is a novel written in 1849 and was one of the most popular novels of its time. The story draws directly from our myth. Trilby is cheerful, kind-hearted, and completely tone-deaf, yet despite being off-key, her singing voice nonetheless has an impressive quality. A young suitor named Billy befriends her. Svengali, an older man, jealous, masterful musician, and hypnotist, tries to persuade Trilby to let him train her voice. But she finds him repulsive and even frightening. She and Billy fall in love. Trilby then falls under Svengali's influence. He hypnotizes and transforms her into a famous diva, La Svengali. Under his spell, Trilby becomes a talented singer, performing always in an amnesic trance. The story has a tragic ending. And now for something very interesting. My Fair Lady is a musical based on George Bernard Shaw's 1913 play, Pygmalion, which is the retold story of Trilby. The story concerns a flower girl who takes speech lessons from a phonetician professor, so she may pass as a proper lady. A London revival of the musical opened in October 1979, produced by Cameron McIntosh with Gillian Lynn handling the choreography. Both of them were original creative minds behind the Phantom of the Opera seven years later. No doubt this is where Phantom director Hal Prince derived his inspiration for the Angel of Music and his female student. It would be fascinating to know if Hal was aware or unaware that Gaston LaRue was independently inspired by Trilby to write the Phantom of the Opera in the first place. Gaston LaRue wrote his gothic horror novel in 1910, in first-person perspective as though he himself were there interviewing various individuals about the strange happenings and murders in the Paris Opera House. The breakdowns for the book and film adaptations have been masterfully done by YouTuber Lindsay Ellis, and I'll encourage you to dive into the prototype story through her great research and video craft. After a mysterious suicide of a stage machinist by hanging, it is declared it may be a murder. Christine Daae, a little-known soprano, replaces her colleague Carlotta, who is ill. She sings so beautifully that the public is astonished. In the audience, Vicomte Raoul de Chagny, Christine's childhood friend is enchanted to find her again, and goes to talk with her backstage. However, she pretends she doesn't recognize him. And later, Raoul hears her talk to a man in her dressing room who later abducts her. Christine is disappointed the opera ghost is a man named Eric, though his supernatural voice enchants her so deeply she removes his mask. He threatens to hold her captive forever, 
Eventually, he relinquished this control, and Christine returns. Lots of disagreements and gaslighting ensue with Raoul, and after the opera ghost overhears their plans to run away together, he drops the chandelier and abducts her yet again, intent on making her his bride. Raoul finds help from a character in Eric's story, the Persian, considered his only friend. Eric was not only a musical prodigy, he was an unrecognized architectural genius, traveling with gypsies as part of their freak show. They visit the deserts of the Middle East, and the Shah of Persia petitions him to build a palace full of torture devices and hidden passageways. Once the construction is complete, the Shah orders the execution of the mastermind to keep the palace's secrets hidden. From here, we can circle back to the myth of Hephaestus, who is rejected and feared by all, and the gods nonetheless use him to make their palaces, as well as the great and terrible tools they rely upon. The Persian, a distant member of the royal family, helps him escape, eventually following him to Paris, where Eric begins work on the Paris Opera House. Raoul and the Persian both fall prey to torture chambers, and Christine agrees to become Eric's wife to save their lives. Removing his mask, he kisses her forehead. She does not recoil, and moved by her tears, Eric allows them all to go free. The musical takes massive departures from the novel, whose characters are regrettably capricious, and the plot struggles to grasp a consistent pacing, seemingly as elusive as the opera goes inside its pages. So, to sum up our mythological research, we've got an amalgamation of Hephaestus, the deformed, rejected mastermind, Eros, desire personified and mysterious lover, Hades, faithful and possessive underworld guardian, Pygmalion, the hopeless romantic, shaping the object of his love, Svengali, the jealous and brilliant hypnotist, Beast, the misunderstood and cursed suitor, as original myths for our opera ghost. While the influences that shape LaRue's mind to bring the Phantom into reality are fairly apparent, nowhere is the gentle, mysterious, sensual angel of music to be found. This glaring difference is of course exaggerated further by its first and most well-known film adaptation with Lon Chaney, which is considered the very first creature feature, by the way, and the Phantom as the first cinema monster. We must make the leap from inhuman creature to tragic romantic with an alluring nobility. What helped bestow that upon our Phantom? Knowing his archetypes, we need to lay a little more foundational groundwork first. Thank you.